Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Living Desert's Tenity Amphitheater. The animals you are about to see are truly amazing. Some jump, some crawl, and some will fly right over your heads, yet all share one thing in common. The desert is their home. Mm -hmm. For the safety of the animals, we ask that everyone please remain seated during the program. If you must leave, please exit quietly at the top and rear of the theater. And now, journey with us into the wild and wondrous world of the Living Desert Wildlife Wonders. Hi again, everybody. My name is Still Matt. I mentioned that before. If you were out here when we had our training session, welcome to the Tennessee Amphitheater. I'm glad you came by to see our show today. we got some cool animals we're going to introduce you to. A lot like that one that just flew by. Does uh, any of the 12 of you know what kind of bird that was? You see his tail? Pretty red tail? Red tail hawk, there you go. Excellent. Probably the most common hawk found here in North America. They're very bold around people. You see them sitting on telephone pole when you're driving down the highway. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's what that big bird is sitting up there most of the time. If you're driving down the highway, you never wonder. Well, we have lots of other animals we want to introduce you to. And while we're glad you're here, and we hope you learned something, we also want you to have fun. That's our goal here today. So if you like what the animals do, feel free to clap for them. Their agents uh, say they love that added attention. And if you like my dumb jokes, please laugh. I need a lot of help. Okay? So we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to introduce you to my partner, Elizabeth, coming out from right over there. She's going to help us with our next animal, uh, which is also a hawk. Now the hawk that we, uh, the red-tailed hawk that just flew by is native all over North America and even down into South America. But the next bird in our show is native only to the desert southwestern part of the United States. It's a very beautiful bird. His name is Hudson. He's a Harris hawk from door number two. This is the part of the show where we're going to make sure you leave a different hairstyle than the one you walked in with, too. <laughs> we're going to fly Hudson back and forth over your head a few times. We're going to do this for two main reasons. First one is it's cool. The other reason is Hawks are predators. They kill things to make a living. And some people think that predators are monsters, but they're not. Hudson there is not nice, he's not mean, he's not a monster, he's just a hawk. And I'll be the first one to admit it. It can, be, it can be kind of sad to see a cute squirrel get eaten by a hawk, but as it turns out, it's better for squirrels that hawks eat them, because most predators catch the sick and the weak, which of course leads the strong and the healthy to survive. So there's no such thing as a healthy planet Earth, unless we have a healthy amount of predators controlling those populations. He only weighs one pound, too, by the way. A big bird like that only weighs one pound. So if you ever see a hawk near your backyard, don't grab the dogs and the cats and the children and run inside. A one pound hawk will eat your kids even if you wanted to. Okay? I promise. And then I also mentioned if you duck, he flies lower. I forgot. All right. Well, don't bother. He's done a great job. Let's send him on home. That was Hudson, our hair sock. Nice He's still alive. <laughs> Okay, whose hair looks better? <laughs> no? All right, well, we try. Now, uh, the uh, hawk that we just had, of course, loved to eat rodents. Well, we're going to introduce you to a rodent now, so it's good that the hawk is put away. And uh, honestly, though, the hawk has no chance in the world of ever eating this rodent. His name is Linus. Oh, hi, Linus. Here we go. <laughs> Linus is an African crested porcupine. African crested porcupines, of course, are from Africa, and they get their name... Well, first of all, let me tell you, this is a mammal, just like you and me. So all these quills that he has on him are just specialized or modified hair. And uh, he's got many different types of quills. These quills right here are where they get the name the crested porcupine, and they have those quills so they look like Don King. <laughs> now, uh, again, uh, this is an African porcupine. It's a little different than the North American porcupine because uh, the African porcupine, these quills are much longer than the North American porcupine. Some of them are more than a foot long, and they are just as sharp as any hypodermic needle you've ever seen. So this is an incredible defense mechanism right here. Uh, he's got lots of different types of quills. Of course, he has whiskers like your dogs and cats do. Uh, he's got some quills on his back end. Look over here. These are sort of like whiskers on the front end. It lets them know who's in front of them. Come on over here, Linus. There you go. So these are called guard quills, and again, they're like whiskers for his rear end. He has some hollow quills down near his tail that he can rattle. Sounds like a rattlesnake if you make it too mad. It's warning you to stay aware. Uh, the porcupines are neat. Uh, have you guys ever heard of a hedgehog? Yeah, they look a lot like a miniature porcupine, except they're not even closely related. Uh, nature has an interesting way of coming up with the same solution for, for uh, solving problems like defense. Sharp quills help defend you. So the hedgehog is actually an insectivore, not even closely related. Sort of like a, a, a vultures in Africa aren't even closely related to vultures well, in North America. Our vultures are actually storks. So 
there's a little treat for you. He's done an excellent job. There's a running on home. That's one. They're after King Chris to Porcupine. Man, he was in a hurry today. <laughs> Hard to keep up with him sometimes. Okay. Now let's bring back out my partner, Elizabeth, with a beautiful cat joining us from this side of the stage. This is Ruka. Ruka is an African serval. And uh, serval, oh, by the way, that serval is full grown. There are 37 different types of cats in the world, and uh, only seven of them are actually large cats. The other 30 species are very small, just like Ruka there. Uh, that brown coloration she has helps to hide her in the brown grasses where she hunts for her prey. The spots and the stripes that she has break up the outline of her body. So if she was in tall grasses, the spots and stripes kind of trick your brain. Uh, it doesn't, uh, your brain doesn't see the outline of the animal, so you don't recognize there's an animal there. So excellent camouflage right there. Not to see her tiny little feet. Uh, servals here like to eat birds and like to eat rodents. Well, rodents live in tiny little holes. And so if you're going to uh, catch a rodent in a hole, you have to have petite little feet. Most cats this size have much larger paws. Well, we're going to show you why they have small paws. We'll pretend this is a rodent burrow. It's clear, so you can see her paw go down there. And then uh, there's a simulated mouse down there in the form of a little piece of meat. So we'll let Ruth show you how she catches a mouse when she knows one is down in its burrow. Paw goes down, retractable claws come out and uh, grab that piece of meat. Excellent job. <laughs> Good job. Now, uh, the other thing they like to eat, again, is birds. And if you notice, her hind end is a little bit higher than her front end, very typical in the cat world. And um, that's just basically a loaded spring right there. And uh, Ruka there might spend 15 or 20 minutes, literally, sneaking up on one bird. When she gets close enough to the bird, the bird will usually spot the cat and try to fly away. That's when Ruka will jump up into the air and snatch it from up to 10 feet up. Watch her little jump here. There we go. Pretty impressive. <laughs> now the, uh, thank you. These servals in Africa are actually becoming very rare. The reason, well, two reasons. The first is overhunting for their coat, which looks much better on them than it does the prettiest woman. And the other reason is habitat loss. A uh, hundred years ago, again, there were twice as many servals as there are today. A hundred years ago, there were only a billion people in the world. Now there are more than six billion people. In fact, since this is the year 2000, I'll tell you how many people were in the world 2,000 years ago. There are a lot less people in the world than now live in the United States. Habitat protection is the best thing you can do if you want to help protect the animals. And uh, Ruka's done an excellent job for us, so we'll let her hop on down. Good job. And while she's walking upstairs, thank you, Ruka. Ruka the servo. I'm going to let you know that she's on a leash and a collar. And uh, sometimes actions speak a little louder than words, but I do want to tell you she's not a good pet. If you, uh, for some reason, found a servo for sale, and you took it home, the first thing it would do would be to kill all the pets that you have now. And uh, after that happened, she would want to mark its territory. Servals mark their territory by scratching the couch and the, and the other furniture, and then they urinate all over it to mark their scent. And when you tell them, no, don't do that, they attack you, because they don't understand dominance and negative reinforcement like dogs do. So servals are not good pets. Stick with the domesticated animals. They're the ones who have been bred thousands of really like years uh, for traits that we like. like all right, let's see who we got coming up next. Okay, we have another uh, hawk to show you here in just a second. The hawk that flew over your head at the very beginning of the show was a hair sock, and the next hawk we have is also a hair sock, but it's a female, so you may notice just how much larger she is than the male. So if you want to look under the Tennessee Amphitheater sign, we'll introduce you to Sonora. Again, quite a bit bigger, very typical of the birds of prey the females be larger. Now, she's on a saguaro cactus skeleton. That uh, structure right there is the woody pulp that's left over after those big, beautiful cactus died. Now, in Arizona, hair slots love to perch on the real living solar cactus because it's a good lookout, but there are better lookouts than a cactus, so it's all watch Shinar. She's going to fly over to the bighorn sheep exhibit and go 100 feet up to the very top of the hill over there, or mountain, I guess. And so what you're seeing right now, this is the only place in California you can see a hair slot jumping up on top of the mountain there. Now, from that high, she can see a little brown mouse in a big brown field at a quarter of a mile away. And this is what she does when she spots her prey. She tucks in those wings and comes in just about as fast as she can. Hair socks can fly 90 miles an hour while they're chasing their prey. Here she comes. She's got it in her sight. Back down into the amphitheater. And put on the brakes. Good job. That was Sonora, our hair sock. Nice flight, Sonora. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> All right, now I mentioned that hair socks don't live in the valley here anymore, but there is a pretty little bird of prey that does. It's called the American kestrel, and they would be more common if 
except there are not as many nesting sites as they need. They like to nest in dead trees. Well, whenever we see a dead tree, we really cut it down. So what you can do is to get involved with conservation is come see me after the show. I'll give you a piece of paper that shows you how to make a Kestrel nest box. It's very similar to the one right over there on the wall. And if you put it 10 or 15 feet up overlooking an open area, in a year or two, you'll have uh, kestrels, which are basically falcons. They're the smallest falcon. In a couple of years, you'll have falcons raising their babies in your backyard. It's a very rewarding way to get involved with conservation. But when you protect habitat, you also protect it for the big, beautiful creatures of the world, the majestic animals. And we want to introduce you to one of those right now. So if you want to look at that tea perch, right over there above the kestrel nest box, we'll introduce you to Olympia. This is a golden eagle. Probably one of the most beautiful and powerful animals in the world. She is native to all over Asia and Europe and also the western half of the United States. She's got that seven foot wingspan and uh, talons that are larger than your hand. This is a very powerful animal with eyesight that's uh, probably even better than the hawk. I get to see her wings one more time. That's fun part of my job, watching her fly. Now, as she hops down uh, backstage to, uh, to Elizabeth again, I want to let you know that golden eagles are not rare right now as far as worldwide habitat goes. But there is an eagle that used to live in North, or that does live in North America that you've probably heard of, the North American bald eagle. Now, when I was a kid, they were almost extinct. There were only a handful left. And the reason is because we used a chemical called PDT, and that uh, made their eggshells too thin. Well, we humans found out that, gosh, we're causing that problem. Can we fix it? We stopped using the chemical DDT. Now the American bald eagle is off the endangered species list and doing very well throughout the whole continent. So uh, sometimes when you hear about animals going extinct, you start to feel bad because humans tend to cause most of that. But we don't have to. If we see a problem, we can solve it if we want to. The eagle is a great example of that. If we get involved, we can certainly take a little bit better care of our world. Okay, well, I want to end the show now with probably the most famous resident of the living desert. And uh, she's a beautiful animal. Her name is Rosie. Some of you have probably heard of Rosie. She's a peninsular bighorn sheep. The peninsular bighorn sheep are the, the bighorns that are native to the San Jacinto Mountains right behind you and the Santa Rosa Mountains. And again, this is an animal that a couple hundred years ago, the mountains were full of thousands of them. And now there are about 300 left in the entire world. So we're going to introduce you right over here to an endangered species native right to our own backyard. Now, the peninsula bighorn sheep is the smallest by far of all the bighorn sheep in North America. Most of their only weighs about 150 pounds. A male might weigh 200 pounds, but about 30 pounds of the male's weight are the great big horns that the males have. So that's like uh, us walking around with a bag of dog food on our head for our whole life. That's what the male bighorn sheep have to endure. But they have those horns to do battle with each other. You see, the females here will stand back and watch the males battle with each other. Biggest and strongest, or the fittest male, wins the battles. That's the one the females want to mate with. And so the females are the, the picky ones. They do the choosing of the mate. They want to have the best father for their offspring that they can. That's how bighorn sheep stay healthy. If you look at her feet, uh, Rosie's feet, not Elizabeth's. <laughs> Rosie has feet that are very different than a horse's feet. A horse has one solid hoof for running on the solid ground. Bighorn sheep don't live on the solid ground. They live in the mountains where footing is actually very treacherous, so they have a split or a cloven hoof. It's very soft and rubbery, a lot like uh, the, uh, or a lot like your fingers. Now, uh, we want to demonstrate for you how agile Rosie is with those feet. We're going to show you uh, her athletic ability here in just a second. But they don't have the big fluffy white fleece that you think of when you think of a sheep. That's only a domesticated variety. No wild sheep have the big fluffy white fleece. So uh, that, that trait is only a trait that uh, humans have bred for, for, again, hundreds of years. That's, that's the trait that we breed for in domesticated sheep with those fluffy white fleas. Well, if she hops up there, we'll try her again from that spot. There you go. You can tell a sheep from a goat, by the way, since they look almost exactly like, see how Rosie's tail goes down, goats' tails go up. Goats typically also have a beard. And that's really the main differences in goats and sheep. They're very closely related, but uh, uh, there are some subtle differences. She knows what to do. She does this every day. <laughs> there we go. Good job. That was worth waiting for. Very agile animal. Even for 150 pounds. Thanks. That's what those clover hooks allow them to do. That's a pretty picture sitting up there on the rock. And, and my favorite picture uh, act is not a bighorn sheep sitting on a rock. It's from the Apollo moon missions when they were circling the moon. They turned around and took a picture of the Earth. 
and it looked very tiny and lonely in the vastness of space. And I think if you've seen that picture, that's the only way you can really appreciate how small and fragile our world is. I do know that life on this planet is all very precious. And right now, uh, some of the plants and animals are being forced, in fact, most of the plants and animals are being forced back into smaller and smaller safe havens as we expand our territory. Now, the next 50 to 100 years, many of those safe havens may be destroyed. Now, if that happens, we may lose thousands of species that we weren't smart enough or that we didn't care enough. Well, I know we're smart enough, and if we do care enough to save a few places for the plants and the animals, like Rosie here, our planet will continue to reward us with uh, an unimaginable variety of life for thousands of years to come. And before you leave, uh, we want to thank you for coming out. And if you want a Kestrel Nest Box instruction sheet, come on up here. And if you want to meet Rosie, you're welcome to come up and touch her along the back here. If she's in the mood today, we'll see. If not, we want to thank you very much for coming to the show and have a great day at the Living Desert. Bye-bye. And I forgot. There's our wonderful volunteer, Mary Ellen. She has a Chuck Walla, which is a uh, wizard meeting around here. If you'd like to meet uh, uh, the Chuck Walla, come down and you can meet him. Sorry, you all are having way too much fun. <laughs>